passions they fail not as thou hast been thou forever wilt be great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see very warm welcome to Moncton and Presswick North Parish Church as you join us from your homes. Special welcome if you are visitors and join us perhaps for the first time. We trust that you'll feel welcome as you join us in worship. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. If you were to ask, what is the most practical parable Jesus ever told? I think it would probably be the parable that we're going to hear today. It's a very familiar parable. Jesus said that a master was getting ready to take a long journey. So he called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Then he left. And then after a long period of time, he returned. And when he came back from his journey, he called for an, an accounting, and the servants who had invested wisely he rewarded, and the one who did not invest is condemned. That's the parable. So it is practical. It applies to our lives because it shows how God treats us, how he reacts to us, and how oftentimes treat his blessings. It starts with the master calling in his servants. He said to them, I am going to entrust you with my wealth. So he gives five talents to one, two talents to another, and one talent to another. 
Now, if you're trying to figure out how much wealth he entrusted to them, you need to realise that a talent represented £75 pound weight of whatever type of precious metal was being distributed. So, a quick calculation in my head, it's about 35 kilos. He is the master, they are his servants. He owns everything and they own nothing. They depend upon him. Now he has called them in and said, I've been watching you, I've studied you, and I have decided to trust you in this matter. Now I don't know how many servants he had, maybe a dozen, but out of all of them he, select, he selected these three. He said, I am going away and I entrust you with my wealth. You take care of it. I think we can draw some parallels. You see, the master represents God who has everything. God who is the giver of life. God who gives us the air to breathe. God who gives us the ability to see and think and plan and make decisions. And we are his servants. Every day we depend upon his blessings. We are the servants and God distributes his wealth among us. Now, it might seem a wee bit odd that he didn't give the servants the same amount. He gave five to one, two to another, and one to another. And perhaps we're thinking, well, that's not very fair. But then we realise that this master knows his servants. He was watching them. So he gives to each of them, and verse 15 says, according to his ability. It, if he had given only one talent to the five talent man, it would not have been good use of his abilities. And if he had given five talents to the one talent man, the one talent man would have been swamped, overwhelmed, not, never been able to handle them. But because the master knew his servants, he gave each one what he knew that one could handle. And then he left. That's the way that God works, isn't it? God gives, then he leaves us alone. He doesn't coerce us, he gives and then he leaves it in our hands. He does open doors of opportunity, he gives us visions and dreams, he allows us to see just a little bit of what might be. But then he waits for us to use what he has given and to see if we will be faithful with it. Remember, He's always there to help, if you but ask. So, in a sense, we're never alone. The master returns, and when he comes back, the five-talent man came in and said, Master, you've entrusted me with five talents, and I've gained five more. The master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Then the two-talent man came in and said, Master, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. The master replied, Well done, uh, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Then the one-talent man came in. He said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your talent in the ground. And here, see, this is what belongs to you. The master called him a wicked, lazy servant. Verse 30, as you'll, you'll hear later, it says, Throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. More to follow later. And now we're going to hear uh, the hymn, We Have Come Into His House.
Ross Mackay will now lead us in prayer. Let us pray. God of all time and space, you are with your people of old and you are with us now. You have promised to be with us until the end of time. We give you thanks that in your presence we are not alone. Your love has held us throughout our lives. Your grace has infiltrated our lives, never letting us go, your hope leads us on, encouraging us to find you in ever new and ever surprising ways. We confess that sometimes we lose faith and trust. We look at our lives and our world and don't like what we see. We are impatient, ungrateful and angry. There doesn't seem to be a clear plan. Our ideas come unstuck and we question if there is any purpose to anything. In this time of worship, remind us of your promise never to leave us or forsake us. Help us to trust your promise that you will be with us. Teach us again about the power of your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I wonder how many of you have ever heard the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Do you think that's true, that words can't hurt people? Unfortunately, our words can hurt people. Most people can remember something that was said to them that hurt them. But in the same way that the good words have the power to hurt, they also have the power to help and to make us feel good. There's a verse in the Bible that talks about how God wants us to use our words to help others. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. And the first part of it says, encourage one another and build each other up. Now I'd like to tell you a story. Once there was a candle flame. It was very small. Beside the brightness of the sun, it was tiny. And she thought she wasn't very important or very good at being a flame. The sun's so bright, she thought, and she watched it creep up over the horizon early one morning. The candle flame couldn't be seen as the day got warmer and the sun pulled itself up to the top of the sky. I'm not very good, whispered the flame to herself, very sad and lonely. And all afternoon she was sad and her wax wilted a little and she fizzed and sparked all afternoon. She was so sad that she didn't notice the sun sliding down the sky and over the horizon. Suddenly she was pulled out of her sadness by a voice down below. It was a mouse saying, thank you. The candle was surprised. Why are you saying thank you to me? She asked. Because it's dark and you were the only thing I could see to guide me home out of the danger of the owl. The candle looked around her and noticed everything was shadowy and she could hardly see. But the mouse said, even though you're a small flame, when the darkness comes, I can see you for miles. Thank you for helping me find my way home, little candle. The candle found a great big smile on her face and stood up tall and shone a little brighter, knowing that even though she was a small flame, even the greatest darkness couldn't hide her. So we can see that even though the candle was very small, she could still make a big help. You may feel that you can only do small things that won't make a difference, but that small act could mean a lot to someone else. But we can also see that in our story, it was not only the candle helping the mouse, but when the mouse stopped to say thank you and some kind, encouraging words, the candle felt a lot happier too. The mouse could have scurried past the candle, thinking only of its own safety. But by stopping to thank the candle, they both went away feeling happy. So this week, why not see if you can find a chance to say some kind words to someone you meet? Who knows whose day might be a little brighter because of your encouragement.
Today's Bible readings are read by Roberta Morrison. Good morning. The first reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Now, brothers, about times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly, as labour pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. <clears throat> but you brothers are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. <clears throat> so then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. And the second reading is Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. The parable of the three servants. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Once there was a man who was about to go on a journey. He called his servants and put them in charge of his property. He gave to each one according to his ability. To one he gave 5,000 silver coins, to another he gave 2,000, and to another he gave 1,000. Then he left on his journey. The servant who had received 5,000 coins went at once and invested his money and earned another 5,000. In the same way, the servant who had received 2,000 coins earned another 2,000. But the servant who had received 1,000 coins went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came back and settled accounts with him. The servant who had received 5,000 coins came in and handed over the other 5,000. You gave me 5,000 coins, sir, he said. Look, here are another 5,000 that I have earned. Well done, you good and faithful servant, said his master. You have been faithful in managing small amounts, so I will put you in charge of large amounts. Come on in and share my happiness. Then the servant who had been given 2,000 coins came in and said, you gave me 2,000 coins, sir. Look, here are another 2,000 that I have earned. Well done, you good and faithful servant, said his master. You have been faithful in managing small amounts, so I will put you in charge of large amounts. Come on in and share my happiness. Then the servant who had received 1,000 coins came in and said, Sir, I know you are a hard man. You reap harvests where you did not sow, and you gather crops where you did not scatter seed. I was afraid, so I went off and hid your money in the ground. Look, here is what belongs to you. You bad and lazy servant, his master said. You knew, did you, that I reap harvests where I did not sow and gather crops where I did not scatter seed? Well then, you should have deposited my money in the bank, and I would have received it all back with interest when I returned. Now... Take the money away from him and give it back to the one who has 10,000 coins. For to every person who has something, even more will be given, and he will have more than enough. But the person who has nothing, even the little that he has, will be taken away from him. As for this useless servant, throw him outside in the darkness. There he will cry and grind his teeth. Amen. Thanks be to God for the reading. That parable is a tough parable, isn't it? It bothers us. And I think it bothers us because that more of us would identify with this one talent man than with the five or two talent men. The one talent man was just an ordinary person, a lot like us. He did something that wasn't all that clever. But he didn't steal or embezzle, he just didn't invest the talent. When the master returned, as you remember, he presented it back to him just the way it, he had received it. It hadn't even been out of its box. 
It was pristine. So I'm going to concentrate on this one talent man for a few moments. Why did he do what he did? Perhaps he did what he did because he felt inferior. You know, when you're rubbing shoulders with five talent people and two talent people, and you watch them rubbing shoulders with other five talent, two talent people, and then you look at yourself, it's easy to begin to feel inferior. When you see people doing things with grace and ease, and you have to struggle just to do these things, it's easy to identify yourself with a one talent person. Perhaps there was nothing really special about him. He didn't stand out in the crowd. He was an average person, just like us. So he felt inferior. He felt that they're better qualified than me. Another thing Jesus tells us that the man was afraid. He was afraid because he had analysed the master as being a hard master. You see, he didn't understand the master. God has expectations, and there's no question about that. But God is not hard. He's gentle and understanding and forgiving and merciful. The man didn't understand the master. Therefore, he was afraid and he buried his talent. He didn't use his talent. Now, here's some hypothetical questions. What if the five talent man had buried his five talents in the ground? You know the answer, don't you? They would all have been taken away from him and he would have been considered wicked, lazy, worthless, just like the one talent man. Or what if the one talent man had invested his one talent? You know the answer. When the master returned, he would have been given more talents. He would have been considered a faithful servant too. Here's another hypothetical question. What if the one talent man had invested his talent and it, nothing came of it? He'd it, it lost it or whatever. But that idea isn't suggested in the Bible. Why, why is that? Well, you see, it's because God's word never commands us to be successful. You won't find a place in the Bible where God says, if you try and fail, I will condemn you. God's word commands only faithfulness. Be faithful and God will provide the increase. What do you do when God has entrusted you with five talents? You use them for his glory. If you're faithful in investing the talents that he has given you, he will entrust you with more. If you don't use them, you will lose even that which you once had. Use it or lose it. We've all heard that phrase. You don't lose talents by investing them. You lose talents by burying them. When you invest them for God, God will always honour the investment. You know, if you have an outreach and thousands don't beat a path to the door of the church, that's not our fault. We haven't failed. We're doing what God has commanded us to tell people about the good news. It's up to them to respond. That's their choice. Our choice and our command from God is to do what he asks us to do. There are many churches across our land that were at one time five talent churches, but they buried their talents and now they're empty shells. There are thousands of Christians who reached a level of maturity in their Christian faith and then became self-satisfied and complacent. They decided they didn't need to grow anymore or pray anymore or study anymore. And they started dying spiritually because they buried their talents. The principle never changes. The message of the parable has not changed. God is still the master. Where do our talents come from? They came from God. They are his. So he says, invest 
what I have given you and see what will happen. So each of us listening to this today have decisions to make. If you're already a Christian, maybe you're levelled off in your Christian life, your prayer life has dwindled, you aren't as committed as you once were. <clears throat> Perhaps it's for good reasons such as health or whatever, but that's not what I'm talking about here. It's if you can do something and you aren't, hoping that someone else will step in instead of you and you're perfectly able to and in truth have the time to do it. I'm not talking about putting pressure on yourself or others. Perhaps you aren't sharing your faith with others. You're burying your talent. You're taking your foot off the gas a wee bit. And for those who are not yet Christians with us today, please realise that you have been given talents too. God doesn't leave anybody out. Everybody gets something and he waits to see what you will do. What are you good at? Well, you won't know until you try. If you're listening today and Jesus Christ is not your saviour, then he waits to see what you will do with just the little seeds of faith that have been planted in your life. Will you invest them so that more faith might come or will you keep them in their box or a sack? The principles have never changed. They are always the same. God waits to see what we will do with what he has given us. May God bless you. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. A foretaste of glory divine Heir of salvation, purchase of God Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood This is my story, this is my song Praising my Saviour all the day long This is my story this is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of man. Whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. All is at rest I in my Saviour am happy and blessed Watching and waiting, looking above Filled with His goodness, lost in His love This is my story, this is my song Praising my Saviour my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long.
Ali McBain will now lead us in prayer. Good morning. Let us pray. Creator God, you call us to love and serve you with body, mind and spirit, through loving your creation and our sisters and brothers. Open our hearts in compassion and receive our prayers on behalf of the needs of the Church and the world in this short silence. Holy One, hear our prayers and make us faithful stewards of the fragile bounty of this earth, so that we may be entrusted with the riches of heaven. Loving God, open our ears to hear your word and draw us closer to you, that the whole world may be one with you as you are one with us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You, O God, are our dwelling place, from generation to generation, our shield from anguish and distress. You arm us with, as children of light with hope of salvation, and you protect us by your love. Give us grace to build up and encourage one another as we seek wisdom and abundant life in the strength of your word and the assurance of your spirit. Amen. May you flourish as you use your gifts. May you grow in faith and wisdom and go in the peace and love of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. Yeah.